with lame, uninspired talk radio, tune in to L.A. Talk Radio for reverent, entertaining, and cool talk. You're listening to The Sheena Metal Experience with your host, Sheena Metal, only on L.A. Talk Radio. That's right. It's the Sheena Metal Experience right here on L.A. Talk Radio. For more info on the show, latalkradio.com and sheenamedalexperience.com. Don't forget to email me and let me know what you think of the show. And to call and talk to us live, it's 818-602-4929. That's 818-602-4929. My guest all this hour, making her debut on the Sheena Metal Experience, is singer Josie Cotton. And it's so nice to have you here, Josie. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. It's, uh, um, as people were so excited that you're coming, you have such a beautiful voice and you're like totally one of my favorites of all time because I like that, that, um, you bring almost sort of a glamorous, uh, kind of a 1950s, 1960s Russ Meyer kind of feel to pop music. And I think it needs to be a little more glamorous. Well, that's very sweet and very, and very good timing that you would even say that because, this new record I have has a couple of uh, Russ Meyer's tunes on there, and, and, and they were like the classic, you know, femme fatales, and people say, well, how could you do these Russ Meyer's movies? It's not feminist enough. And I, I think they were the ultimate, the first feminist. <laughs> those oh, girls. absolutely, because they were doing the kind of movies that, that nice girls wouldn't do. Absolutely. They were controlling their own sexuality. And were you fans of the that, that kind of Russ Meyer uh, and those girls, I mean, was that kind of what appealed to you when you were sort of forming your look and, and starting to get to the point where you were going to become a, you know, a pop star? Well, um, I, I, I wish I could say that that w- was my inspiration, but I actually I was not even introduced to them until um, uh, pretty much about 15 years ago. And so that was way after the era. But I think I, I psychically formed my, my look from knowing that, they possibly existed because I, when I <laughs> when I saw them, I went, "Okay, that's uh, I I know you." <laughs> you know, I got to say that that's a first on my show. Nobody's ever told me that they psychically figured out their look for somebody they weren't going to find for the next ten years. Yeah, I'll just I'll say anything. <laughs> <laughs> so when you were young and starting to sing and starting to perform and not discovered yet and not signed and didn't have hit songs yet, who were kind of your influences? Um, because, you know, there was a very definite look in the early and mid eighties and you looked very different from it. You know, you didn't look like the typical kind of toned down new wave girl. You didn't have a space age look. You looked very, you know, Marilyn Monroe retro, very, you know, glamorous Hollywood retro. Well, I, I tell you who I was really inspired by and that was Gina Lola Brigida. Uh, the Italian, you know, movie stars uh, from that era. She was just it to me, and and I and I I think that was my my huge inspiration visually. I, she, I mean, how do you get more sexy and and va va voom than that? It, it just really amazes me that people don't know who she is so much. Yeah, uh, I, I think I think everybody knows who she is. Yeah, yeah, but I say Gina, and they go. Huh? <laughs> that's kind of, you know, we as humans are so busy trying to chase the next thing that's coming that we forget too much about our history. Well, especially uh, it seems like in the United States, we don't even appreciate or understand our own history. It, it has to go to another country for it to be fully comprehended. Japanese understand us more yeah. about our culture in Europe, and it's just odd. We we're a disposable culture. We we right. we let go of our best creations. It's, Even our buildings, we tear them down. We just build another one. It's all about what's new and not about what's beautiful and classic. Yeah, it's it's an odd thing. I don't I don't understand it. You know, I I don't get it. So, do you find when you go out of the country to Europe and Japan and South America that people are like, oh my god, Josie Cotton, and lose their minds? More so than here? Uh, no. I mean, no. <laughs> well, you know. I'm a huge hit in my dry cleaners. They they just go crazy in there. But um, no, I don't know. <laughs> People don't. They don't recognize me. I, 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 I go uh, 
I go discreetly through life with no one noticing me. Yet. Do you like that? I mean, is that is that good? I mean, is it good yeah. to live a normal life and not be known? And then if you want to be known, then you make an appearance or do a red carpet or come on a radio show, and then people know who you are. Yeah, I mean, I like it. I like when when I go out and 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 people will say they'll know who I am because people go, "That's her," <laughs> and then they know, and that's fine. I can be the persona, but I I think it would be kind of a torture. To, to do that nonstop and, and a loss of privacy, I uh, I just think that would just be an unbelievable burden to not have that anonymous moment, you know, on the street or whatever. Or just be able to go to your dry cleaners and, you know, be left alone. I mean, obviously, you're mobbed at your dry I'm cleaner. Mobbed. But, I'm mobbed. But then you can maybe go the next place and be left alone. Yeah, and I have, my clothes have to be really clean when I bring them in because they'll, they'll judge me harshly. Oh, so you actually go to, like, a ghetto dry cleaner and get the spots <laughs> removed. And then you take them to your yeah. dry cleaner, pretend. and they're already perfect. Yes, and I pretend that I think that they're slightly soiled. Because <laughs> they expect a rock star to bring in perfectly clean that's clothes it. to be clean. That's it. I have an image to uphold with them. Yeah, I think that's very important. How did you, um, how did you get started? How did you get signed? What's kind of your story? Uh, well, my story is I came from Texas to basically be a songwriter, and I wasn't really interested in being a singer. Um, I accidentally met my producers uh, kind of in a bank. It's Hollywood and Vine. This is one of these horrible Hollywood stories. And um, and uh, they were uh, doing a demo for Johnny, Are You Queer? And um, um, they just had a falling apart with the Go-Go's they had been working with and, and whatnot and took the song back. That was a song that they did live uh, for, you know, a while. And so I just thought that song was just amazing. And so I pretty much begged to do it. And and um, and finally they relented and, you know, and then it just became a, a record all, all of a sudden. It was not planned. <laughs> it was not a planned thing. I just wanted to be a songwriter. That was it. So you were going to come here and be like the next Diane Warren and just write songs for people that were going to be sell them to people who were going to sing them and just become a hit songwriter. Uh, that's what I, I really wanted to do. But, um, you know, what I hadn't planned on was meeting the Payne Brothers, who, who basically schooled me of, of real songwriting. I, I was I was, you know writing all kinds of things and and they really taught me the real um the real way of of writing a, a pop song and in in country they're you know a kind of a rockabilly guys but that was that was a, a real education for me because i finally knew how to how to do it you know in a correct way and johnny are you queer i mean i think it was such a groundbreaking song because we weren't really talking about queer then i mean queer still kind of meant odd and quirky I mean, people didn't really write songs about, I mean, you know, the, the inference it might have been what Ode to Billy Joe was about, but we didn't really talk about stuff like that. I mean, nobody just did a song where they blatantly said, you know, maybe my boyfriend's gay. It's kind of weird. Well, yeah, and that was the inspiration when, when Jane Weedland uh, was, was talking to Larson Payne, in, uh, the, who you know, ultimately wrote the song, and she said, oh, all the cute boys are gay. And he he saw that that was real, a real social phenomenon. That was actually something going on, and no one had had um, you know you know noticed that enough to to put it into into music. And they were working with this punk band called Fear. I'm sure you know who they were, and True. they had kind of a, a a part of a chorus with that line in it: "Johnny, are you queer, boy?" But it was a whole lot of real, prof- as you can imagine, fear. <laughs> was like, right, right. I don't even was know it, how much I can say on this station. Yeah, right, it wasn't. It wasn't your Johnny or your queer. No, no, no. It wasn't <laughs> nice. It wasn't nice. Uh, and so they, they, they pretty much, um, you know, borrowed from from both those ideas, the the real raw punk version and and whatnot. And and I, you know, I thought it was funny and I thought it was timely at the time. And I, I had no idea it was going to absolutely cause a meltdown in, in in the music business and and get banned in Amsterdam that was interesting yeah, in Amsterdam where you can you know walk into a McDonald's and get a hooker and a, and a bong full of hash yeah but you can't sing Johnny are you queer no 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 that's a dangerous thing there's no gay people in Amsterdam <laughs> only hookers and uh, heroin addicts yeah we love them but yeah. no gays yeah and they're they're hooking while they're shooting heroin <laughs> exactly it, they've yes. joined the, all yes. the best together you can also get a pastry and good coffee to yeah. go with your heroin and hooker yeah but no Josie Cotton 
button in here. No, no. And um, it was just odd because, you know, when in Canada it was on AM radio. It was number two record right under Joan Jett in, in Canada. And then it was banned in Amsterdam. And, you know, and then in the United States, um, uh, the right wing became furious about this song. They, w- they were just absolutely enraged and really thought that I was not a, a, wo- a woman or a female and that it was a, a gay man speeding up his voice to promote men to homosexuality. Oh, oh really? Oh, yeah. So you, you, were, you were the gay mafia. You were a drag queen. I, well, and you had a gay agenda to turn it. the whole country through the secret subliminal yes. messages in the song. That's right. So if you spun it backwards, it said like, come on, no, be gay. No, no, no. I, I, I saw on one of those religious shows, you know, the gal with the pink hair and whatnot. <gasps> what is her name? She's the, the best. She's the, the best. The Reverend Jan Crouch. She's the best. And she yeah, was, I grew up in Orange County and uh, she was like, a, she hung it. over Orange County like I'm a Oh my giant God. devil. Well, she, I, I, you know, I have a, <laughs> I have a very odd sense of humor, and I would watch, I, I would watch those shows like, oh you no, do. they're not, they're not saying that, and I, they were holding up the single of Johnny Oye Queer, and I was going, no way, come on, come on, what isn't going on now? And it was their son, and he was screaming into the camera, holding it. Yeah, and, their uh, son with the bad mullet that had the music video it. show in the eighties. Uh huh. I grew up in Orange County. That's, that's where right. they came from. Yes. Yep. And he he was claiming that there was no Josie Cotton, and I was like, oh, thank gosh. God. I uh, I was so relieved. Born Joseph but- Cotton. <laughs> <laughs> so that You're was You're like, really you know funny. what? I was just trying to go to the bank. And do some that's banking. That's right. That's right. I, I didn't mean to wind up here with this the, was an the Aaron- pink-haired lady zapping with a pitchfork. I just wanted to make a deposit. That's right. This is an errand gone wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, but the really crazy thing to me, and it was odd, and this was this was the thing that really hurt my feelings. I mean, to be totally honest, was on the on the West Coast. It was like an anthem that you know that was it was like a you know really received in this amazing way. And on the East Coast, um, uh, there was such political correctness at the time that they they really were threatened by this song as well. And so I, I say in this this article I wrote in, in Magnet Magazine when when I was telling the, the queer story of Johnny and Josie that you know they they joined arms together these unlikely uh, you know allies <laughs> the extreme right and the the East Coast gay community and um, it was just an odd. Time. Oh, so on the East Coast, it was not popular with oh, the gay Oh, God, community. no. No, they... Because they, they, you said queer, and they thought you were slamming gays. Well, they, on the cover of the Village Voice, one, one, when it first came out, it was, Josie, are you a bitch? And they this, they reamed me a new one in that article. Like, if she didn't, like, sound like a whining goat, you know, when you might want to... It was wow. really... I, I, was, I was shocked. I really... Welcome to success, Josie Cotton. Thank you. That's not a very good story, <laughs> is it? I hope you at least got to make your deposit first. Yeah, yeah. Let's lighten this up. I hope up. you laughed all the way to the bank. Yeah, wow. Well, hmm. Let's play something off your new oh, album. okay. I have to tell you, that's a fascinating story that I didn't know, and we could just talk about that for, for two hours. Um, I, I am, that's my favorite part of the album so far, although I have not heard it, is the forward by John Waters. Yes. My favorite director in the whole world. In the world. Oh, he is so amazing. In college, I used to follow him around when he did the lecture circuit. And just go listen to him speak. I saw him maybe five or six times. No, he's he's the, he's the most brilliant man, and he's the most polite, businesslike. I, I had dealings with him, you know, and he's very businesslike. There was no funny business. There was no humor in in his business. Uh, you know, I would try and crack a joke, and he was just, let's just do this. And I'd go, okay, John, okay. Oh, no. no humor, I'm, I swear. The serious side. Oh, yeah. Well, he was one of those East Coast gays. He was, but Man. but he, he but he also put me on his a date with John Waters, uh, you know, disturbing love songs for the ages. He he said he he, what was one of his favorite songs? So he really wasn't. He was more the Minneapolis mafia. Yeah, <laughs> they're 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 huge, you know, somewhere. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, and Baltimore's not, we don't, it's not really a part of the United States. It kind of hangs off the edge. It's all, it's its whole country in and amongst itself. And it is, it's that's from someone who grew up there as a child. So really? it's partially, yes, all I right. did for four years in the late 70s. And nobody really should have had to live through the late 70s any place, but especially in Baltimore. So let's play something off the CD. This is, um, 
This is Man Eaters, and the CD is called Invasion of the Bee Girls. So it kind of has that whole Russ Meyer. Oh yeah, no, this is a this is great songs from bad movies. It's actually theme songs from B movies of the '60s and '70s, and this is uh, uh, from a, a song called She Devils on Wheels, where the men have to die at all times. <laughs> Basically, this motorcycle gang of, of girls, and it's it's a horrible movie and a great song, and and that's the whole concept. <laughs> Herschel Gordon Lewis was the director. So you became a fan of that whole genre. Oh, yeah. And decided you wanted to record all the theme songs. Oh, yeah. Well, I've always been with sci-fi, horror, be, you know, bad movies uh, forever. Yeah. And then when I was turned on to this, it was like the heavens opened up or hell opened up. Something opened up. <laughs> and I and I stepped through. And it, and it was I was so inspired by the the music, the great songs from the bad movies. Yeah, because it was the original kind of underground you know, alternative music well, were was. the themes to these movies. And what was it when I went on this like massive like hunt for all these movies and I saw an amazing man, what I realized was it was in the B movies that were all the strong females were in, yeah. in that era. They weren't in the in the other movies. They no, they, they were, were the in, wives. They they were the wives. They were in those movies. Even yeah. in Mexico I found some the Aztec women versus the the mummy versus the uh uh, the as the Aztec mummy versus the Mexican wrestling women <laughs> oh <my laughs> from the sixties, and they were badass. And there, I'm telling you, there were no movies in Mexico about women who kicked men's asses. Right, and that was the thing was all these B girls were ass kickers. They were ass. They kickers. would beat you up. They were, and in fact, the the um, the title "Invasion of the B Girls" came from a very famous science fiction, well, famous to me, <laughs> uh, B E E girls, and and uh, but there was no theme song, so I didn't use it. But they were women scientists, foxy women scientists, who were actually bees who killed men during sex for their blood. Mm, it's Perfect so plot line. Sad that I've seen it. <laughs> And probably many others that you've seen. <laughs> Welcome to the world of the twisted sense of humor. Nice. It's the Sheena Metal Experience, LA Talk Radio. This is from Josie Cotton's new album, Invasion of the B-Girls. It's called Man Eaters Get Off the Road. Check it out. And then by all means, find the movie.
Sheena Metal Experience, LA Talk Radio. That's Josie Cotton from her new album. It's Man Eaters Get Off the Road. The album is called Invasion of the Bee Girls. And every song that you hear is a theme song from a bee movie, mostly from the like 50s, 60s. 60s and 70s. That, that was my criteria. And, you know, for. Um, and it was it was going to be all female themes because there were so many in that world. There were so many, uh, you know, female, you know, ass kickers. But then I found black Klansmen. I had to break my own, you know, <laughs> my own morality <laughs> because it was just so in quite in such questionable taste that it was just I could not do it. We're, we have to play that next. Yeah. So was black Klansmen. Um, uh, was that was the theme song originally done by a woman, or was that no, originally done no, by a done, guy? It was done by a guy, and I mean the funny thing about that movie is it, it was it, it was done by actually a director who was very pro civil rights. I mean he had the best intentions with this movie, I'm sure, but the fact is the the guy who infiltrates the the Ku Klux Klan is a full on like brother with an afro, and no one notices. It doesn't no. stick out from the hood, even though it's like <laughs> no one, nine feet out in the air. No one notices. He's black. Yeah, you know. So they right. were. They, they gone. can't see through the eye holes. <laughs> I mean, those are pretty big eye holes. So it was just funny, but this that's was, great though. This is one, and this was the song that no one would admit to writing to uh, writing the song, and we found his family, and they and they denied till the end. We just don't know. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but and yet it's a great song. It's it's so sad to me because it is one of the best songs from these these movies that I heard. Was it hard to get the licensing yes. for all of these? Yes, I mean, it's- it went on and on and on. It was so insane that you know I had a, a lawyer and a, a, a manager working on it, and it it would be months even before we'd hear back from them. They go, well, they're like they moved to Kentucky. And, <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah. And then try and find them. And Where they, all bad songwriters go to we, die. That's right. <laughs> and um, and so it was it was an, it was very bizarre and surreal. And no no one had ever done this before. The publishers going, that's a great idea, but we don't know if we can do it because uh, we don't know how to do it. And it was just an odd thing, you know. And, and then to go to Japan for Goodbye Godzilla and try and find those people. And then I had to get I had to you know get permission to use Godzilla's voice, his scream, his famous scream. Right, and, uh, that and that's was, sacred in Japan, and that's sacred, and it, and that it's cost, part of their national anthem. Yes, it is, <laughs> and uh, and uh, and that you know cost money, but but you you had to track the people down to even buy Godzilla from. So it was it was just uh, like kind of a mini you know, mini series. It was like a scavenger hunt slash reality show. It was kind of like that. just trying to get the licensing to all these songs just, nobody never heard of. Yeah, yeah, and that's kind of the interesting thing that I think that people because so much of the music in films in the sixties and seventies. Because of the licensing was so crazy, you didn't things weren't scored like they are now where there's like, you know, 10 pop songs in each episode of Cold Case. You pretty much had the the score that the that somebody did which sounded like either bad guitar or bad piano through the whole film, and then sometimes there would be one song that That's would right. be the theme that would play sometimes at the beginning when the credits rolled or at the end or both or like all the way through it. Written you know? by like the director's friend or somebody's <laughs> brother because there was no budget for anything. Yeah, absolutely. And so, you know, that was uh, that was an unexpected, you know, detour doing this record, the just the the business angle because you couldn't put it out. I mean, p- people were telling me, I had a lawyer tell me, well, just just put it out there and they'll just they'll they'll find you and sue you. And I went, "Ah, no." Yeah, that's I, a, that's a real gr- a lawyer told you that. Yes. He said, no one's going to come after you. Sue you, and then, then you can hire me as they each sue you, all ten of them. Yeah, yeah. I'll That's tell good, them he Good told advice me. from a lawyer. Uh-huh. Yeah. I, I didn't use him. How to get some work. Just get sued and then yeah. call me. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like upselling for a lawyer. Hmm, ten lawsuits are coming and I can yeah, handle them all. That's right. So um, uh, where did you get the idea to do this? I mean, you've always loved the films, I, and you've always loved the you love the songs when you listen to the films. Yes, and then yes. When did you think, you know what, I'm going to make an album? Okay, of there, all of these. there was it was one specific night, and I was watching the um, the movie uh, he, Hedra, the 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 three headed monster, and it was where the um, the twins are in the flower singing to the pulsating giant larva with long eyelashes and wings, which was Mothra, and they're singing. There was a moment when it was the most beautiful song. It was it was heartbreaking. It was so beautiful. It's like, oh my God, this is so beautiful. And and watching them sing to this giant larva, it was so absurd and so beautiful. And I thought, this is the best feeling I've ever had 
I don't, I don't even know if there's a name for this, but it was so bizarre. It's like a feeling you normally have to drop acid to That's have. right, yes. And because I was it's like, so wrong and it's so, so right at the same time. Yes, it was just everything. And I went, oh my God, what a great idea to do a whole record of theme songs for B, from B-movies. And that was it. That was the moment. And I, and I sing it on this record, and I sing it in full-on Japanese. Oh, <laughs> and you're right. Probably nobody has ever done that. Well, I mean, a couple of the songs, you know, I think the Cramps did, uh, you know, a faster pussycat, and but no one ever did Beyond the Valley of Dolls theme song. I couldn't believe it, and uh, you know, of course, Black Klansman. No one, no one's <laughs> ever done Black Klansman, but we're gonna play it now. now yay! Black Klansman, uh, the writer's still MIA somewhere in Kentucky in a trailer park. We're not sure where. May in fact be related to me since my <laughs> family comes from a Kentucky trailer park. So this is from Josie Cotton's new album, uh, Invasion of the Bee Girls. It's the Sheet of Metal Experience, LA Talk Radio. And as promised, a little black Klansman for you. <laughs>
listening to the Sheena Metal Experience with your host, Sheena Metal, only on L.A. Talk Radio. That's right. It's the Sheena Metal Experience right here on L.A. Talk Radio. For more info on the show, latalkradio.com and sheenametalexperience.com. Don't forget to email me and let me know what you think of the show and to call and talk to us live. It's 818-602-4929. That's 818-602-4929. My guest all this hour, singer Josie Cotton. She's got a new album called Invasion of the B-Girls, and it's all theme songs from B-movies from the 60s and 70s. Probably... Some of the finest films ever made. Well, if you're, if you're a, you know, you love that. You're a geek for that genre, like I am. I, I, I am, and and uh, I, I, I don't understand when when people do look at it, you know, harshly because to me it, it's just like such a great era, and there's just so much there. And, and so, some of those films are so funny. I mean, whether they mean to be or not. They're funny and they're campy and they're edgy and they were really breaking boundaries at the time. I mean, they were the Johnny Are You Queer of their they day. They were. They were absolutely. And 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 what's odd about B movies now is they they're too good. <laughs> no, they're, they're indie. <laughs> they're in. Right. Oh, right, the indie movies. Right. But it, you just you make a piece of crap and then it wins something at Sundance. It, You're like, but wait, it was supposed to be exploitative <laughs> and now it's being revered at con. But you know, they're just. I just don't think there are. I mean, B movies just don't exist like they did. These right. these were. Uh, they should not be able to use that term anymore. They do in the horror genre. I've seen a couple of really bad ones lately that were. Oh, that's nice. Really good. I saw one about a devil baby, and it was basically oh, nice. like a baby doll, and somebody would just kind of like kick it along, <laughs> and then there was a terrible sound effect. You supposed nice. to think it was crawling on the ground, but you could tell somebody was just kind of kicking it off camera. It was kind of like moving up, you know, jaggedly. <laughs> I heard there's a uh, there's a new movie called Taxidermy, which is like s- some kind of horrible horror movie but really beautifully filmed <laughs> but but um nice yeah so i mean that's that's true the b the b movies in um in horror it, it still exists thank god yeah not sci-fi so much anymore because now people cg stuff for a low budget so it it looks too good to be bad you don't see the the ufo on the string anymore that's right. the, the fishing wire with the airplane on it and the, the, the alien with the rubber you know vibrating <laughs> mask exactly <laughs> and the big rubber feet that don't quite fit and look like they're going to fall off at any time and oh, it's I, classic it's, it's classic. beautiful um, it, we, so you've had this sense of humor since you were little. I mean, have you always loved absurd, bizarre? I have, I have, and I and I, I I've I've written about it a little bit because I I could never quite figure it out, but because uh, no one, no none of my friends were into it, and I and I I think it had to do with the fact I felt so weird as a kid. I was such like an outcast, one of these like you know these angry dark children, and and that was where I felt normal when I would watch those movies. That that, that was where I fit in and and it, it was like that made me laugh and it made me happy I, I don't know what it was you were like the original goth girl I was kind of like you know the Adams family little girl <laughs> like, I hate you <laughs> you know and right. when I would watch those movies I just it was just a, a, another world and I and I went into it gladly it was like these are my people these these monsters and aliens and vampires and zombies yes hello <laughs> see and I was the opposite I was the perfectly normal looking preppy girl with the twisted mind oh. I just loved that stuff I always have and uh, I have a very bizarre sense of humor that I inherited and all I see my mother has it too and I think things are funny that are very off the wall. I remember the first time I saw a John Waters film sitting in a, with a group of people in college and two of us were enamored and everyone else didn't get it. Yeah, see, that was when I, when I was doing the research, this magnet article I wrote about uh, a lot of these movies. I had a five-part series and it was in March and it was really great. But I was, I was doing all, all this research and, um, you know, it, it, was, it was just like... Um, um, well, I kind of forgot what I was saying. So you're, you're you're a songwriter and still writing songs. You just you're writing a new album now, and also you're you're also a, a journalist now. So you're writing and 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 writing about these films. Well, yeah, and it's 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 really fun uh, to do all the research. I I actually love the uh, the reading about the history of it and and these people. And and when I was doing that with Beyond the Valley of the Dolls, and I. I had this image of, of Russ Myers. It, it was it was something just a kind of a porno guy who made a, who made a couple of great movies accidentally, 
And then I, I learned there was so much about him. Oh, I remember exactly what I was going to say. When, when, they, when they actually screened the, the original Beyond the Valley of Dolls, the, the audience did not know if it was a comedy or not. And like some of the people were laughing hysterically, but most were in shock because they didn't know what it was. It was like a new thing. It was absolutely new animal, and, and they didn't know how to react. And I thought that was amazing. It was they were crossing over all these boundaries, and there was actually it was actually the original was a lot more uh, sexy. He they they edited it. <laughs> Fox really um, uh, took it down a, a few notches. There was full on uh, sex going on, and and they cleaned it up a bit. But uh, yeah, so I just thought that was it was fascinating. Well, you know, in the '60s there weren't really films that that legitimate film anyhow, or films even even underground films. There weren't films that showed the absurdity of humanity. You know, everything everything in the movies was just a little prettier than it is in real life. Exactly. And people were either heroes or they were villains. Or villains. But they weren't just like absurd, que- creepy. See, that's you it. You know, oversexed, white trash, bizarre. I mean, all the things that, you know, you could walk out of your door and find in all of your neighbors. Absolutely. But we didn't portray that then. Yeah, it was hidden. It was this hidden thing and it could only come out in these B movies. And I just, I thought it was just a, an odd thing for me because that I'm also like such a fan of the absurd. I mean, that to me, that is like a great teacher, absurdity. It, 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 it exposes reality so many times. Oh, yeah. Much oh, yeah. More, reality is, is, is so shallow compared to absurdity to me. I just, you know, that's no, I, I, I agree. I think you watch a Russ Meyer film, you watch a John Waters film, and I think oh, yeah, I know her, and I know him, and she's kind of like her, and oh, yeah, I've known that guy. Um, other people are just appalled. Maybe they don't look at the world the same way that we do. I, I don't know what it is. I don't know. Some people, they they like to be told what to think, and they, they, they like uh, to tell other people, and they want a s- certain type of order, and right. they want you know things to be all in their little boxes, and when things start spilling over, it's it's really something they can't deal with, and they want the world to be just a little bit prettier than it is, a and little a little prettier. bit more pleasant. Yeah, or a little more moralistic, or a little, right. or a little right. more s- sexy than it normally yeah. is. Yeah, and I want to see all the hedonism and the trash and the freaks, cannibalism, and the, the weirdos and the crazy people. But then I want <laughs> it all to be f- laughed at and be funny. Yes. So it's so it's not it's not scary. It's it's funny because I think those things freak us out about humanity, just being people and. Being a human on the earth, um, absolutely. You know there are there are people like everything you'd see in a Russ Meyer film. There are people like everything you'd see in a John Waters film. You don't encounter them every day, but things that are in B movies do exist. You know, maybe not people singing to a moth with eyelashes. <laughs> no, wait a minute. I have seen that. <laughs> I've seen that in West Hollywood. I, <laughs> I, I've seen that, but I think it was in a Sid and Marty Croft production. <laughs> Okay, so let's let's play this song. This is Beyond the Valley of the Dolls. This is from Josie Cotton's album, Invasion of the Bee Girls. It's the Sheena Metal Experience on LA Talk Radio. Check this out.
So know that a hand extended to your fellow man is a gesture of love. And if love is in you, then gentle will be all your days as you walk beyond this life. Metal Experience, LA Talk Radio. That's Josie Cotton from her album Invasion of the Bee Girls, and that's Beyond the Valley of the Dolls. You know what's strange is all these songs that we've played, Josie, they all sound like they would be the themes for Disney movies. Like they, you, There's nothing that you think would be from something that was like a bee movie or an exploitative movie, because they're all so melodic and and uh, happy and yeah yeah they, they it has the the well they got really good songwriters I mean in this song when I had this very famous guitar player who was in the uh, uh, underground band called the Fibonacci's he said there were so many chords in Beyond the Valley of the Dolls it was so musically complex every every single you know, uh, you know measure had a different chord in it and it was so they got some some of them are they got really really great songwriters. Or with the uh, Get Off the Road, it, I, I really did up, upgrade the, the, the quality of that movie. <laughs> it was really, it was not so good. But I mean, they're not, you know, they're not songs, they're not angry, and they're not right. violent, yeah. and they're not overly sexual. I mean, they sound like, you know, the the theme song when you go to heaven. No, it's right, it's right, and, until you listen to the lyrics, you know, a, a little bit, and... and uh, and then, and then you know right. it's not Disney. So you listen to the lyrics from Black Klansmen, <laughs> and then you're a little freaked out. Do they think I'm white? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Josie, where can people find you online? Well, I'm uh, josiecotton.com is my website, and I I'm mainly on uh, the MySpace, the MySpace uh, Josie Cotton thingy dot slash thing. Yeah. Whatever that. You Are you know. on Facebook too? I'm I'm recently on Facebook. I don't get Facebook. I really don't understand it. I don't know. They're not really fans. They're not really friends. I don't know who these people are. Yeah. I just, <laughs> I'm trying like to scope it out right now. Cyber dots in your life. Yeah, it's like I don't. It's like it's an odd netherworld for me. I don't know what I'm doing there. I, I but I'm on there, you know. And uh, so I'm trying this. You'll I, figure it out. It's a great way to talk to fans, and I bet you have fans from all over the world and 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 you know, all all walks of life, even some of the East Coast gays that didn't like you in 1980. Now whatever. I've been. All seems to have been forgiven. Now. <laughs> It's okay. Now there've been songs that say worse. That's right. And then I guess once if you if you last long enough, if you keep doing music and they haven't like you know pummeled you to the ground or 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 if you haven't given up, that somehow you you are victorious in yep. in people's eyes. Everybody I, loves a survivor. Yes. Probably not the lady in the pink wig though. She's still going to chase you with the pitchfork. Oh I bet. wow. Well, you know, especially I, when she sees Black Klansmen. No. <laughs> Although secretly, that's probably her favorite that's song. That's probably her favorite. She's song. got one she called White Klansmen. She's going to put out about her own life. Well, you know, later on, when my last manager, I, I, uh, he, he was friends with their grandson, and he, he, he told me that they were actually using that for brainwashing in some of these Christian camps where they would keep them up all oh night to convert them, and they would play the song to test them to see if they were. It's your own little I, Clockwork Orange story. It's, it's kind of it's like terrifying. that. Terrifying. It really. Is. Sweetie, you're fantastic. Will you come back and see me again? Oh, I had such a, a great time. I you're, would love that. You're a gal after my own heart. Yes, you have to come back. And I will. Just come and sit in with me and we'll just do a topic yes. on horror and sci-fi yes. and take calls. Oh, okay. You got it. It's so much fun. Everybody, Josie Cotton, she's terrific. You can find out more about the show on Facebook, MySpace, Twitter, SheenaMetalExperience.com and LATalkRadio.com. It's the Sheena Metal Experience. <laughs> 
You know what we do here. Every Monday through Friday, 5 to 7 p.m., we rip the veil off the human sideshow and expose the creatures I like to call big old homo sapiens at their most bizarre. And it's true every day on the show. It may be my show. It is the Sheena Metal experience, after all. But that doesn't mean it's not always and forever, undoubtedly and indubitably. You know what I'm going to say, people. It's my show, but it's your experience. Have a good Friday. Have a good weekend. And I will see you on Monday. You found the number one internet site for irreverent, cool, and entertaining talk programming. It's L.A. Talk Radio. We say what we want.